and I was born February the 16th, 1911, in 307 West Main Street at 11 p.m. in Charlottesville, Virginia. Main Street, of course, was made of brick then. See the right-hand side going west, there were storefronts, different stores, and people lived up stairs over those storefronts. There was a barber shop, a tailoring shop, and a little shoe repair place, a drug store, and there was a wholesale fruit plant, and a livery stable. You could rent a horse and buggy from there. That eventually became a garage. The largest store that I can remember was Harris's Hardware Store, and then it had Harris's Foundry down Fifth Street that they would repair wheels and buggies and so forth. On the opposite side of the street, there were residential homes. And the streetcars would run right on up through the University of Virginia they could turn and come back down Main Street. What we call the upper station, which is the combination of the Southern Station and the CNO, that's where the circus would come and unload. You'd get up at 4, 4.30 in the morning and go up and see them unload these cars and see how they would make the elephants work. They would have a big circus parade right down Main Street, past where I live, and the street would be crowded, and people would be coming in and there from the country and all around. The uh, time I came along, the only thing that a Negro could do was either be a physician or a dentist or a minister or a school teacher which I didn't like any of those fields. And I studied and found out that the funeral director, you could be independent. And so I selected the funeral business. How did you become aware of the racism in society? Well, in my particular situation, I think you became very aware of it when you started school. And where I lived, the so-called white children went one way, and the so-called black children went to another school. And these were children that you knew? Yes, yeah, where you went to school, right? And uh, so you were aware of that, and then you were aware if you went to the railroad station, they had one room set for colored and one room for white. And if you went to the movie theater, you were segregated. They had a balcony for the colored, and for then the. Uh, Downstairs was for the white, and in one theater here in Charlottesville, since there were just few colored people going, the whole balcony, they just set aside one side and roped off the others for the white. And you became aware without anybody telling you. And now, uh, you How did your parents explain this to you? There was never an explanation. It was, uh, we, we just learned these things, and uh, it wasn't, uh, sometimes it was discussed in home, but isn't that a shame that, you know, they're doing this, or isn't it a shame that they're doing the other? And uh, I think uh, the, uh, it could have been that my parents had expected more equal opportunities in, instead of the uh, state setting up more segregation laws. See, a lot of laws were set up in the early 1900s by the Virginia General Assembly uh, for segregation, you know. So, uh, 
this was something we inherited. And if you don't like your inheritance, then you have to get rid of it. And that's what I've tried to do through my life. And as a child, when I moved to Cleveland, I recognized segregation, even though it wasn't any law. The, the Ohio had no laws for sex. And then when I went to New Haven to live, I recognized segregation. And the same way when I was in embalming school in New York. But while I was in Cleveland, my father took us to hear Dr. Du Bois, who was the head of the NAACP. And we had literature showing certain things that were happening in newspapers. I was always interested in newspapers. And uh, as the NAACP progressed to break down segregation, I became interested. And when the opportunity presented itself after 1954, I put forth every effort I could right here in Charlottesville to equalize our opportunity. Applications that were made to the schools under the guidance of the NAACP were turned down. Then we employed the NAACP legal staff to look into this, and it ended up that we had to go to court. And we had a long, drawn-out struggle with that. The judge assigned my daughter and another little boy around the corner here to lay in high school and some other children up to Venable. Then eventually the next year, the schools began to come integrated. When you were a child, what did children do for fun? To play games and play uh, hide and seek and play uh, little games in your house. And then you would read and study. And you had a whole lot of homework. Children had a whole lot of homework that they had to do in school then. And as soon as you came from school in the evening and did your daily chores and did your homework, it was time to go to bed. You no, know, you didn't have a whole lot of time to play. When you look back, do you look back with any regrets or any things that you would have changed? Well, I've never been greedy. And if I can have a roof over my head and serve the public, that's my main concern. With being involved in the funeral home profession, I'm really curious to understand your views on death. With so many people, it's something to fear, but with you, it's part of your life. Has that changed how you understand it? Well, maybe my understanding is that there are three things that are sacred to me, that's birth, baptism, and death. And the fact, I appreciate the fact that medical science has really improved in the years I've been associated with it. But then I also realize that, as my father told me when my mother died, I was 13. And I thought doctors could do everything. And he explained to me that doctors do what they can, but when God enters and takes somebody, that's we can't do anymore. And so I look at death as a thing of uh, God taking over. And regardless of what man does, he cannot save a person when it's time for him to die, you know.